Hey folks, I'm Scott Weingart, and this is the MCrit Podcast. Today on the podcast, the Kovach Kata. What does that mean? Well, you'll find out momentarily, but let's get a quick advertisement in so we can dispense with it. Reanimate, ED ECMO, and cardiac arrest. We only have about a month left before the course. If you want to get in, you will soon not have a ticket available to you, so buy now. Reanimateconference.com. Use the code MCritter. Like M crit plus T E R, so you're an M critter, like a little furry animal, an M critter, um, and then you'll get an enormous savings for both nursing and doc tickets. Um, tickets are about to sell out, so go reanimateconference.com right now. Okay, let's get to it. The Kovach Kata. So my friend George Kovach is the premier, in my mind at least, airway guru in Canada. Um, the best person out there teaching this stuff to learners and uh, has had a huge ramification on my airway thinking and my airway teaching. So um, this is in dedication to him. Now, MCRIP Podcast 236 with George going over his vision of laryngoscopy and tube delivery and using the system of EVLI, epiglottoscopy, voleculoscopy, laryngoscopy, and intubation. And he described that mental rehearsal model as a kata. And kata is a word from Japanese martial arts. And it is the practice pattern and performance of a set was uh, more freeform. It was sparring or in some of the martial arts uh, I was involved in, it would just be a... uh, set of attacks. So instead of knowing exactly what's coming at you, it was from a uh, circumscribed range of attacks, and you'd learn to therefore uh, have the element of surprise. And, and the beauty of kata was always that it was the most classic expression of each move, the most beautiful expression of each move. What you- well done kata is truly a, a work of art. It's, it's dance. It's, it's, it's performance art. And, and so George described this EVLI as kata. And Um, I've been teaching a little different variant of uh, a kata uh, inspired by George. He he speaks about it in terms of EVLI, but I speak about it only in terms of the moves for optimization of each attempt at laryngoscopy after you've already optimized your uh, EV and uh, potentially parts of your L. And so you're at the, the moment where you have gotten optimal technique to get your best view with merely your mouth opening and laryngoscopy alone and your initial positioning before you got in the mouth. And now you're at the point where you just don't see an adequate view of glottis. And now if you don't know what you're doing, you might call this a failed attempt and come out and you may change blades or get someone else to take a look, and you, you've missed an opportunity. You've missed an opportunity for the patient because each additional pass is associated with badness. You've missed an opportunity for yourself. This may have been the last chance you were given to actually be able to intubate. Someone else may take over from you. Um, and so that's where I have been teaching a kata. And uh, I think we need to call it the Kovach kata for a few reasons. One, uh, Four out of the five uh, were actually inspired or taught to me directly by George. Uh, Not that I hadn't necessarily seen them in other places, but he put them into, uh, I think, the best form that just locked into my mind as just associating these moves with George. Um, and, And then George does not like things named after him. He does not like eponyms that involve his own name. And therefore, to razz him a little, then we should surely at every juncture call it the Kovach Kata. So the Kovach Kata for me consists of five parts. And what we're gonna do over the next 15 minutes is try to first teach you what these five parts are, but then find ways to use learning theory to embed them into your memory such that you will never have to actively recall them again. That's the key. You see, I could tell you these things. George has told you these things in beautiful videos you'd find on the MCRIT site and linked in the show notes. Um, But 
they have to still be recalled from your memory. Oh shit, oh shit, what do I do, what do I do? Oh wait, what was the thing that I was supposed to do to optimize? What I'm gonna try to do over the course of the next now 14 minutes is um, to, to give you a way that you'll never have to think about it again. So we're gonna use all the forms of catchiness, of stickiness to lock these into your head. So the five moves are neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. And we're gonna go over these one by one and then we'll do some furtherances to try to lock them into your brain. Okay, let's talk neck. So I've spoken about this countless times, George has as well, but if you're not having a great view and your move is not to immediately put your hands on the patient's thyroid cartilage, which as you know, anatomically, is connected directly to their vocal cords, their glottis, and you're not moving it to actually optimize your view with bimanual laryngoscopy, then you're missing out. Now, videos changed everything because now all of a sudden, uh, a friend of yours is seeing the same view you are. And Ruben Strayer uh, first brought it to my attention that, hey, jackass, um, you don't have to move the thyroid and then have someone take up uh, the exact movement with uh, limited success. They could be looking at the screen and just optimize. So whether you're doing this or you're asking someone to do it for you, um, you should absolutely be both lifting the laryngoscope to optimize view, but also pushing the glottis down into the line of sight of your camera on video, or if you're still a Luddite and using direct, then into your line of sight. But please, everyone should be using video in my opinion right now. Uh, and so this is the first move of the Kovach Kata for optimization. If you get into the molecule, you see the epiglottis pop up and then you lift and you could uh, still not see any portion of that, those posterior structures, the retinoid, the notch, then your first move should be to push down on the neck uh, or have a friend do so. So that's the neck of the Kovach Kata. And I, I just don't understand why people aren't doing this automatically. In fact, uh, the way I teach the cognitive task analysis of laryngoscopy is this should be happening before you seat in the vollecula because doing thyroid manipulation prior to seating in the vollecula actually changes the vollecula from a potential space to an actual space. So if your hand's are already there, it's natural that you'll continue that optimization once you seat in the vollecula, but most people's hands are not there. So that is the neck portion. So here's a video from George's site. They're using direct and we'll see what best view they could get. They'll find epiglottis. There it is. Seat in the vollecula. You saw epiglottis move, you know you're in the vollecula. Lifting. No great view, but now watch what happens when you put your hands on the thyroid. Oh my God, Pogo 99%. Fantastic view, and if you let it go, crap view. So that's the key, right? So let's see it again. Great view coming in once we push down on the thyroid. It could be you, it could be your partner. If they're looking at the same screen, you don't even have to ask them to take over. They could take it from the very beginning, and now you'll be able to intubate this patient fairly easily. Head. We've spoken about optimal position on MCRIT a number of times. Uh, head above the sternal line face plane parallel to the ceiling, and then the head pushed forward so that the neck flexes as much as possible. Uh, find the MCRIP Positioning Podcast that is linked in the show notes if you don't know what I'm talking about. But sometimes uh, positioning beyond that point will be markedly helpful for revelation of the glottis into your line of sight or the camera's line of sight. Um, and that might be that you were inadequate in your initial positioning and this will fix the problem. Or it might be that you actually need additional lift in order to go beyond that point. Uh, in fact, there's uh, literature to support head flexion beyond the point where you'd ever have a direct line of sight uh, as uh, the ability to show you the glottis uh, on video in cases you wouldn't otherwise. So the move here is to actually put your hand underneath the patient's occipit and continue to lift first to optimal position if you hadn't already done it, and then beyond optimal position, and that might mean the patient's neck flexes. Um, and then obviously you need a friend in order to then have them take up that holding of the occipit so you could deliver the tube. And so you just pre-brief people that, hey, if I ask you to hold the head where I stick it, please hold the head where, you sti where I stick it. And then that's all there is to it. And now all of a sudden, uh, even if you're not strong enough to adequately lift such that you, you guys know by now from listening to MCRIT that you don't call it a, uh, enough head lift until the head actually leaves the bed, assuming the patient's not in inline stabilization. You don't give up on 
uh, lifting as the way to optimize glottic exposure until the head actually slightly pops off the bed. If you're unable to do that just due to muscle strength or the patient's head is enormous, um, then adding a second hand will also help you optimize head lifting and therefore um, will allow a better glottic exposure. So uh, two hands, uh, one on the laryngoscope and one on the head, assuming you have a partner, is an excellent way to go. And that's the head portion of the Kovach Kata. Now, what about hands? Well, let's say you're alone and you, uh, you don't have a friend. Well, then if you don't have adequate lifting force, you want to continue lifting the head at least until it leaves the bed. And you might not get that from one hand, especially novice intubators. If you're alone, the move is to put two hands on the laryngoscope and then use both arms to lift. And you might say, well, what the hell am I going to do then? I'm alone. Well, the thing is that maintaining a muscle force is not as hard as getting there. So as a result, you will be able to maintain with one hand what took two to get to. And now you could further your ability to maintain by locking your elbow up against your body. So you, you start off with your arms extended. You move your body in so you maintain the same view, but now your elbow is resting on your body, and that's going to give you mechanical force to be able to maintain. Now, this is not necessarily just for when you are alone, because sometimes the problem is not the head being lifted, but the jaw muscles being relaxed by the action of your laryngoscope fully extending. Now you might say, oh, they're paralyzed, they should be relaxed. Well, sometimes they're not fully. And what you'll discover sometimes is if you lift adequately, you'll see the head lift the, off the bed and then touch the bed again as those muscles relaxed. And then you could lift further. So having two hands on the laryngoscope to allow full lifting force and then maintaining that is another little arrow in your quiver in the situation in which you do not have adequate glottic exposure. So, so far we've done neck head, hands. We get to scoop. Scooping is for when you've perfectly seated in the vollecula and you have a big epiglottis blocking your line of sight and you've done external laryngeal manipulation. You can't get the glottis in it, uh, view. You've done head lifting. You can't get the glottis in view. Um, that glottis is just not moving out of your line of sight. And the move in the old days when I was taught was to switch to a miller and pick up the epiglottis and not have to worry about the fact that the epiglottis may be floppy or obscuring. Well, I don't teach Miller anymore. I think every Miller intubation you do is at the expense of your learning curve for Macintosh laryngoscopy as an emergency medicine or critical care person. Maybe, and I don't even know if this is true anymore, but maybe in anesthesia you'll get enough to have multiple blade mastery. But in EM and critical care, I'd say every attempt not done on Macintosh blades uh, or their surrogates, the hyperangulated, still are basically the same technique in terms of the actual uh, glottic exposure um, in terms of your hand motions, maybe not in terms of what you want on the screen, as we'll talk about momentarily. But uh, all of those are on one learning curve, and Miller's on an entirely different one. But what I quickly realized, and I think most smart airway managers have realized, is that the Macintosh works just fine as a Miller for this purpose. And so if you're having that situation, then the move is to scoop up the epiglottis with your Macintosh. So you just um, kind of tilt your hand a little, grab up the epiglottis and then go back to your normal uh, angle and orientation for lifting and all of a sudden the epiglottis is gone and you should see glottis if the only problem was epiglottis uh, obscuring your view. So that's the scoop. So surprisingly, I can't find any videos of this online. If you have one, send it to me. I'll put it in the show notes. But this is a picture from a airway article in ASEP Now from Rich Levitan. And you can see it's a kind of grisly, uh, horrible epiglottis, not a great view, and using a GlideScope 4 blade just went right over the epiglottis, and now you have a direct view of the glottic structures. So, you know, you sometimes need a longer blade. A, sometimes a Mac 3 video won't suffice, so it's nice to have a Mac 4 in these circumstances. But always remember, if you just can't visualize past the epiglottis, then just lift the epiglottis. The last one is pull back. And this is specifically for the situation of a hyperangulated blade, whether it be the CMACD or the GlideScope hyperangulated, in which you have a wonderful view of the glottis. In fact, too good a view. The glottis is now filling up the entire screen. 
and you just can't seem to get the tube in despite the use of a stylet or a properly uh, bent uh, bougie. You, you just can't get the tube to go where you want it to go, and that's because the angles are wrong if you're that close to the glottis. And you guys all know this, but you forget about it in the heat of the moment. And the move there is easy. You pull back until the glottic structures are filling the top third, or at most the top half of the screen. Crap your view equals easier tube passage, and all of a sudden you will be able to intubate this patient. So that's the Kovach Kata that I teach, uh, dedicated to George, a little bit different than his EVLI one, but let's really lock it in. So first of all, I tried to make the steps uh, easy to remember and mentally recite. So neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. But you got to go further in your actual practice of this to lock it in. And the hand motions are there as well. So let's see that. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. And just to be clear here, you're not using all five of these on every airway. Usually you'll just use one, maybe at most two, but having them in your pocket to use when you need them, to not have to think about, well, what should I do now or abandon an attempt, that's the key. So actually acting it out will have a real potent effect on remembering it. So. You could recite in your head just before intubation. You could actually remember the hand motions right before intubation. Now, what would be really great, in addition to seeing it, hearing it, visualizing it, and practicing it with your hands would be um, singing it. But I'm not good enough, so I'm going to send this video to my friend, the EMC, and see if, if my friend Han over there could... Uh, could do a little something with this. I don't know if he's going to be up for it, but it'd be super cool. I mean, this, I think it's, it's just, you know, poised to be developed as an EMC wrap. You know, it just builds itself. You know, when you can't see shit and you're taking flack, neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. I, I think you could see where this could go. So that would be just amazing. But Think about this kata right before you're about to intubate, at the point where you've done everything right and you still can't see. Don't give up on the attempt. Optimize with the neck, external laryngeal manipulation, whether it be you or your friend looking at the same screen. Lift the occipit with your uh, right hand uh, to the point where you have them perfectly positioned if you didn't do it already, and then go beyond that. Keep lifting and, if necessary, flex the head to see if you can get a better view and then have someone take it over. If you're alone or you think the problem is you're just not adequately relaxing the jaw, lift with the laryngoscope with two hands and then lock your elbow against your body to actually maintain that view and be able to intubate. Scoop up the epiglottis if you've optimized all these preceding things and the epiglottis is still obscuring your view. Just get rid of the epiglottis. And then if you're using a hyperangulated blade and you can't pass the tube, the problem is you're too close. So pull back until the point where you get a crappier view but a better angle for intubation. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. Neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. It's called the Kovach Kata, and you should call it that every time you see George so that he could really, you know, begin to love the fact that something wonderful in the world is named after him. Um, and I think we should name all sorts of great stuff after George because he's such an amazing teacher and a wonderful guy. There's already the Kovach sign, which is when you do go too far with your hyperangular blade, hyperangulated blade, you could actually see um, the anterior cartilages of the tricoid, and that's a sign uh, that your angle's all wrong. It's too far tilted and not horizontal enough. So that's the Kovach sign. Now we have the Kovach kata. I'm sure George is going to write me and tell me that I'm an asshole for doing this, but it's all out of love. Um, this is dedicated to you, George. Keep up the amazing work, and I hope you folks like this. Talk about it in the show notes at mcrit.org, and until then, I am Scott Weingart from the MCRIT podcast saying... Bye-bye.